take your Bibles and turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm sure you're all curious now what we're speaking on after Pastor's delightful little intro over there. Um, we're back in 1 Peter. We're diving back into our discussion on our series on the alien living of the Christian in this world. 1 Peter here is specifically talking about you and I as Christians, as followers of Christ, being sojourners in this life. And Peter is writing here to the five Roman provinces of Asia Minor initially, and he's focusing on their conduct. How do you live as a Christian in this world that is decidedly not Christian, right? What do we do? How do we live? What is different? Do we continue on as we always did? Or are there certain areas of life that are affected by us being now followers of Christ? And this began specifically in chapter 2. We reviewed a lot about the gospel in chapter 1. Then we moved into chapter 2 with how Christians should interact in the world in specific, specific areas like submission to government and submission in the workplace, submitting to our bosses. And now in chapter 3, Peter turns his attention to the realm of life that, I'll be honest, I would personally like to just kind of skip over and jump to the next section on. But it is dealing with specifically the realm of the home, and even more specifically the realm of marriage. How do we as Christians now act in the realm of our homes and in our marriages? Uh, My wife just walked in in the back, and she told me that she was texting her mom this afternoon, and her mom asked what I was preaching on, and when she responded, she said, wow, he's brave. (laughs) I don't think that was supposed to be encouraging. I don't know if it was or not, but anyway, that's what we're diving into, folks. We're going to dive into this discussion on how do we live as Christians in the home? And right away, some of you might be thinking, well, Pastor Josh, I'm, I'm actually not currently married right now, and there's a good football ga- game on coming soon, so maybe I can just slip out um, and let the people that this directly applies to stay and benefit from it. And certainly this topic may not be directly a- applicable to every single person in the room tonight, but there's certainly something for everyone to learn. Whether you're a young man or a woman who will one day, Lord willing, find a spouse to spend the rest of your life with, this is a tremendous preparation for that day. For others who perhaps are not married, you certainly know people who are married or perhaps have family members who are married or daughters or sons that are married and need good counsel and help in their marriages from time to time. All of us who are believers also recognize the multitude of parallels between marriage and our relationship with God. And a proper biblical relationship and marriage being a picture of what our relationship with Christ is like. For those reasons, every believer here tonight can benefit from Peter's message regarding marriage and what I'm entitling maintaining an alien marriage. Maintaining an alien marriage. Let's take a moment and read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. It says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of 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 plating of hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price." For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection under their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Peter was clearly not fooled into thinking that every marriage is a picture of heaven on earth. In fact, he recognized the immense danger of two very selfish, fallen, sinful people with their own perspectives, their own priorities, their own idiosyncrasies, their own way of folding laundry. Their own definition of cleanliness, their own preferences of food, their own bedtimes, their own favorite TV shows, their own perfect temperature for the house their own favorite way of doing everything in life. He understood the dangers of joining two such people together in this God-ordained institution between a man and a woman called marriage and somehow making it work. 
Because of our fallen world and sinful flesh, Christian marriages are just as susceptible as non-Christian marriages and to struggle and ultimately fail. In fact, the percentages are shockingly similar of how many marriages, Christian and non, that fail ultimately. I believe that it is a sacred institution of marriage that Satan would most desire to see fail. Because when marriages fail, families struggle. And in turn, churches struggle. Brothers and sisters in Christ are affected. Much hurt comes from broken marriages. Understanding how to live in love and peace in the household is of vital importance. But there's a more specific context to this conversation of marriage in 1 Peter. And while the principles for all marriages certainly can be learned here, Peter, for the last several verses, has been dealing with how we as Christians should interact with a what? A non-Christian political work sphere and now home life. The context here follows the same vein, specifically instructing Christian women and men who find themselves married to a husband or wife who are not followers of Christ. And there are many, many Christian wives and husbands today who find themselves in this situation having major questions about how do I love, how do I honor, how do I respect a spouse whose identity is outside of Christ and so different from my own. Peter here gives guidance and hope to spouses in this specific situation, as well as instruction for all wives, all husbands, in their role in marriage. The first thing that we see in verse 1 in our view of maintaining an alien marriage in this fallen world is this. Number one, a wife transforms through submission. A wife transforms through submission. Verses 1 and 2. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. How do we understand this idea of submission? Peter begins the phrase with the word likewise, meaning this is the area, or the third area of submission that he is dealing with. First was the necessity to submit to our political leaders, right? Right? And then there's the necessity to submit to our work leaders, our bosses in the workforce, and now the home. And here is the time, perhaps, when some of you might be hoping that after diving into the Greek and the deeper meanings of this word submission, that it doesn't actually mean subjection, right, Pastor Josh? That can't be really what it means, right? And there are some commentators that I want to take this passage and, and make it fit a little more neatly into our modern culture. And they use verses such as Galatians 3.28, where it says that there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor, mer- nor, nor male nor female, for we are all one in who? Jesus Christ. And that's a great passage, and certainly it applies in part to what we're talking about here, but given the greater ta- context of Scripture and the multitude of similar commands to wives found in Scripture, to jump to that conclusion would not be consistent with all that God has to say. So what do we do now with this word submission? Submission here literally means being under authority. Meaning, as it sounds, that as previously addressed by Peter, a citizen should be under the rule of a government, a worker under the rule of boss, and now a wife is to be subject to the leadership of her husband. All right, let's be honest. I may have lost about half of you right there. That probably doesn't sit well with some of you because the word submission in our culture today is almost universally viewed as what? A very terrible thing. Submission is perceived as relinquishing identity, giving up who you are. Today's definition of submission usually has something to do or said in the same breath as things like oppression and lording and abuse. Why would God command such a thing for marriage? Our culture's mantra today is, don't let anyone tell you what to do or who to be. Be your own person. Prioritize you above all else. Remove anyone from your life who throws off your groove. Any fans of Emperor's New Groove here? You've thrown off the Emperor's Groove. They fly out the window. That's how we're taught to treat people that aren't supporting who we are. And to be in subjection seems to teach the exact opposite of this. Now, today's context is certainly different than the one that Peter was writing to. William Barclay gives some good insight into the Roman Greek culture back then. He said this, In every sphere of ancient civilization, women had no rights at all. 
Under Jewish law, a woman was made a thing. She was owned by her husband in exactly the same way that he owned his sheep and his goats. On no account could she leave him, although he could dismiss her at any time. For a wife to change her religion while her husband did not would have been unthinkable. This is the context in which Peter is writing to. So when Peter commands these women, these wives, to be subject to their husbands, it would not have come as a surprise to them. Subjection was exactly what was expected of wives. Today, wives, today's culture is, is much different than that, right? And rightfully so. And in so many ways, we have certainly progressed, thankfully, from that terrible way in which marriage was viewed and handled in ancient times. But we do th- view things much differently. Where once this command of subjection was expected, it is now not just foreign, but highly really resented and misunderstood. How do we reconcile the command with the many concerns and questions that might arise from it? Pastor Josh, does this mean that a wife's value is lesser than her husband's? Does this mean that the wife is not allowed to have a voice or an opinion in the marriage? Does this promote inequality in the home? The short answer to this is a resounding no, it does not. When Peter was previously speaking to all the Christians about submitting in their various realms, whether it be government or the workplace, he was not preaching a message of inequality. Don't misunderstand this. But rather a God-ordained model of functionality in government, workplace, and now the home. Without a proper structure of leadership in each of these realms, there would be chaos. Part of God's design of functionality in society hinges on this principle of submission, even in the home. Now, going back to that word likewise at the very beginning, it speaks obviously looking back to the nature of how we submit in other realms of life, but there's a greater reason. Remember, this is all hinging on what? On our identity in who? Jesus Christ. Everything that we're talking about here, including all the submission talk that we've been going through the last several messages in this passage, is dealing ultimately with who we are in Jesus Christ. We ultimately submit in all of these areas because we are following the example of Jesus Christ who willingly submitted himself to the Father's will. Philippians 2.8 says, And being found in fashion as a man, he what? It's talking about Jesus. He humbled himself and became what? He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Imagine the ramifications if Jesus chose not to submit himself to the Father's will to die on the cross for our sins. And make no mistake, he submitted himself to the will of his Father. Christ himself yielded yielded to his Father's will. And it is that example that encourages and guides us to do the exact same thing in our realms, whether it be the workplace, the government, or wives in the house, in the home, in your relationship and marriage. Submission is not a harsh restriction of inequality that God places on his people, but it is part of the beautiful dynamic of the functionality we see exemplified even in the Trinity of God. That allows all members of the Trinity to work in harmony harmony together, but it does not take away from their individual roles and importance. Submission, like the Trinity, is part of what makes the institution of marriage function the way it is supposed to. We've dealt with the structural reason for submission as part of God's plan for order in the world, but Peter takes or talks specifically about the incredible power of Submission, specifically to influence and transform the husband. Peter says a wife who is submissive does not even need words because she lives the gospel. Look, look again what he says. He says, likewise, you wives, be in subject, subjection to your own husbands. And I'll just point out here, your own husbands, all right? This is not that you're in subjection to every, every husband out there. It's your own husbands. That, in any, that if any obey not the word... Talking about husbands who are not saved, they are not followers of Christ. They also may, without the word, without a word being spoken, be won by the what? The conversation of the wives, meaning the action, the example of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Here Peter gives a scenario of a wife who probably got saved after she was married and her husband was still an unbeliever. And given what we know of that culture, this would have been an incredibly 
difficult situation in a household back then, possibly leading to the oppression of the wife, who was at that time considered the property of her husband. This would have made the marriage very tough and sometimes even abusive. Often in marriages like this, where husbands were unbelievers, the woman, the wife, with very good intentions, would seek to zealously win her husband to Christ, believing that what she was doing was the best possible way to see her husband come to know the saving faith that she did. And so zealously preaching to him, even sometimes condemning his life of sin, and Peter calls women not to do this. Pastor and author Gregory Brown put it this way. He said, Peter essentially says the life of submission, which, God's, which was God's perfect plan for the wife, is so beautiful, so saturated with the gospel, that it could save the husband without a word. A wife who was rooted in the sin nature that came from Adam would have been trying to usurp the husband's authority their whole married life, arguing with him and seeking her own way. But all of a sudden, Christ came in, and there was this great submission that would radically speak to the husband and potentially saving his life. He would see the purity and the reverence of her life and it lead to his own transformation. While Peter directly applies this principle to the scenario of a saved wife and an unsaved husband, this also directly applies to marriages in general. How often is the chosen method of instigating change in a spouse that of a passive aggressive comment? Choice words meant to jab, arguing and nagging to get the desired change, all of which only bring what? More tension, more heartache, more bitterness, more anger. Peter preaches the beauty of silent love here and the immense power of a Christ-like example to change. Christ beautifully submitted himself to a cruel death on the cross, never uttering a word to his accusers but demonstrating his love through faithful submission to his Father, and in doing so, he instigated the greatest change for all eternity to all those who would call upon the name of Jesus and be saved. What greater example is there, wives, than to live in your marriage as Christ did on this earth, instigating change through silent and faithful love? The great George Muir told of a wealthy German whose wife was a devout believer and he was not. And he says this, I'm just going to read what he says. He said, this man was a heavy drinker. Spending late nights in the tavern, she would send the servants to bed, stay up till he returned, receive him kindly, and never scold him or complain. At times, she would even have to undress him and put him to bed because he was so drunk. One night in the tavern, he said to his buddies, I bet if we go to my house, my wife will be sitting up waiting for me. She'll come to the door, give us a royal welcome, and even make supper for us if I ask her. They were skeptical at first, but decided to go along and see. Sure enough, she came to the door, received them courteously, and willingly agreed to make supper for them without the slightest trace of resentment. After serving them, she went off to her room. And as soon as she had left, one of the men began to condemn the husband. What kind of man are you to treat such a good woman so miserably? The accuser got up without finishing his supper and left the house. Another did the same, and another, until they all had departed without eating the meal, and within a half hour, the husband became deeply convicted of his wickedness, and especially of his heartless treatment of his wife. He went to his wife's room, asked her to pray for him, repented of his sins, and surrendered to Christ. From that time on, he became a devoted disciple of the Lord Jesus, one without a word. George Mueller went on to advise, don't be discouraged if you have to suffer from unconverted relatives. Perhaps very shortly the Lord may give you the desire of your heart and answer your prayer for them. But in the meantime, seek to commend the truth, not by reproaching them on account of their behavior toward you, but by manifesting toward them the meekness, gentleness, and kindness of the Lord Jesus Christ powerful story and demonstrates the power of, like Christ, seeing change instigated through example, not word. We've seen how a wife transforms through submission. Number two, a wife's true beauty is internal, not external. 
A wife's true beauty is internal, not external. Verses 3 through 6 say, Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating of hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Peter here seems to make the connection with wives, perhaps thinking the most important part of their influence in the world and even with their husbands, and way to honor him was through excessive external adorning. Peter instead encourages them towards a more meaningful beauty, what he calls an internal beauty. It should be noted that Peter here is not condemning all external adorning ladies. He's not condemning the use of jewelry or doing your hair, dressing nicely. That's not the point here. But he is condemning doing these things in excess. In the immediate culture Peter was writing to, those who could afford to would wear extravagant jewelry and hairstyles, clearly showing the world around them that their status and their value was based on their extravagance of the external. God refers to such women in Isaiah 3 as haughty and prideful, overly consumed with their outward beauty. 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10 is a great parallel passage. It says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Ladies, while there is nothing wrong with dressing in a way that is pleasing to your husband and dressing in a way that is talked about in Proverbs 31, 22, Peter here is warning of the danger of being preoccupied with the external to the abandonment of the internal. Proverbs compares such a woman with a pig who has a gold ring in his nose. Kind of a humorous illustration there, but I think the point gets across, right? You can dress up all you want to, but if the inside, if the true nature is not that of beauty, it is not beauty. Not only is it wrong for a woman, or a man really, to place too high a value on external appearances, it is likewise wrong to seek men's approval rather than to strive to please God. That which pleases God is, what does he say, a gentle or a meek and quiet spirit. Not boisterous, not loud, not haughty, but meek and gentle and quiet. One author describes it this way. Peter pictures a woman who is in control of her emotions and her actions. Instead of blowing up over issues, she is calculative. She ponders her responses. Is this just my opinion or is this something God would have me to be angry about? This woman desires to only be angry when God is and not at other, th- other times. She bears up under hardship and is gentle in her responses. She is Christ-like, who was also described as what? Gentle and meek in spirit. Wives, it is ultimately the beauty of the character and heart of Christ that Peter says to adorn yourselves with. Because in doing so, you will achieve influence, not of your own fame, not of your own beauty, but the fame and beauty of Christ in your life. Peter goes on here to use Sarah, which we should all be quite familiar with based on pastor's morning messages through Genesis. He uses Sarah, Abraham's wife, as an example of one who lived in subjection to her husband with a gentle and a meek spirit. All right, here's the deal. When I read this initially, and maybe you did as well, I kind of was like, Sarah? It's like, I don't... You know, what I know of Sarah, I don't like that much. And if, you're, if your name's Sarah and you're named after her, nothing against that at all. But Sarah in the Bible we've talked about wasn't exactly the picture of the, the model woman that I was thinking of. Particularly when we're looking at Genesis 16 and, verse, and chapter 21. There isn't a whole lot to like, but for all her faults, Sarah did demonstrate well this heart of submission to her husband, which is seen in her addressing him as, what does it say, Lord. In Genesis 18, I'm going to read that. You're welcome to turn there if you'd like. 18, 9 through 15. Over in Genesis. It says, And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. 
And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in years. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah, what? She laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being also old? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, uh, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. So we're familiar with this story. And again, I'm thinking that th about this story and thinking, that's not a good example. She, was, she lied and she doubted. But there's a key word there. For all Sarah's faults, we see her, even in her personal thoughts, refer to her husband as what? Lord. Now, we have a rare opportunity to actually see the thoughts of somebody, right? How many of you think that if Sarah did not respect her husband, she would have referred to him as Lord in her own mind and thoughts? She refers to him as Lord, and this speaks to the respect and honor that Sarah had for Abraham. Now, I'm not suggesting here, ladies, wives, that you start calling your husband Lord. Um, maybe if you want to start, I'm, yeah, I'm not opposed, but um, <laughs> just kidding. Definitely wouldn't recommend it. That's, that's definitely a cultural thing. However, it speaks to the respect that she had. Now, put yourself in Sarah's shoes for a moment. Imagine leaving your homeland, your family, and all your friends to go to a place that God had not even yet revealed. There in Genesis 12. How many times did Abraham come to his wife to tell her, hey, listen, God has instructed us to go somewhere. And this all appeared very foolish to her, probably. As far as we can tell, Sarah was probably never present when God revealed his will and his instruction to Abraham. It could have been a most terrifying thing to have been married to Abraham, but Sarah did submit to Abraham, first in her spirit and then on a day-by-day -day basis. And for this she became an example of godly submission to all of us. So wives, in this manner, are you like Sarah? Living in your God-given role of submission to your husband. Respecting and honoring his role as the leader of your marriage, your home. Can you be described as a wife who is meek and kind, more concerned with internal beauty than external? This brings us finally to verse 7. And ladies, for the time being, I'm done with the ladies. We have men now. Now, I, I find this interesting. I don't know why in these seven verses God spent six on the ladies and one on the men. I don't know why. All right? I certainly don't believe it speaks to the, um, the actual amount of issues between one or the other. I'm not sure why. But he chose to use one verse for men, and we're going to learn from that. So look down at verse 7. It says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, meaning wives, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not what? Be not hindered. We finally see that, number three, a husband loves his wife by understanding his wife. A husband loves his wife by understanding his wife. First thing we note here is this principle of consideration. Consideration. Husbands, to dwell with them according to knowledge means to live with your wives in an understanding way. It means to be considerate of your wife, specifically being sensitive to her deepest physical and emotional needs. That word dwell means living or dwelling together, referring to an intimacy and a heartfelt caring for the wife. A great parallel passage to this is Ephesians 5, 25 through 28, which says, Husbands, love your wives even as who? As Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Paul here gives more insight into this command. Literally, men, making the comparison of loving your wife as Christ loves the church. How about that for a bar setter? Our example, how we ought to love, 
Our wives is like how Christ loves his church. What greater love is there? Because what did Christ do for his church? He died for his church. Meaning he gave everything. That's the kind of love, men, that we have, that we ought to have for our wives. To consider here means to give much thought to something. To care enough to want to know more about your wife. Caring to know her thoughts, her emotions, her feelings, and all that affects them positively and negatively. Husbands, do you know your wives? Next principle we see is that of chivalry. We've all heard the phrase, chivalry is dead. And uh, that probably is true in many realms for different reasons. But let it not be true in the realm of marriage. Peter tells husbands to give honor to the wife as unto the what? The weaker vessel. And it's important here to note that just like submission, this does not imply an inferiority of roles. Neither does the word weaker imply that wives are somehow weaker of character or intellect. Definitely not intellect in our house. I can't remember where I put my keys five minutes ago unless Megan helps me find them, all right? Not everything, pretty much, all right? So she is certainly my brain sometimes when it is not functioning right. This does not mean that wives are spiritually weaker than the husbands. In fact, the sad reality is that it is often the wives who are so much more spiritually mature than the husband. This is simply referring to the general, though certainly not universal truth, that women possess less physical strength than men. It's really just as simple as that. And part of God's design, husbands, is that honor is given by lovingly protecting your wives. Men, your wives ought to view your presence as a safety to themselves. Certainly not as a harm or a state of fear, but as a precious and loving guardian of herself. We also see the principle here of companionship. The end of verse 7 says, And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Heirs of grace, or heirs of the grace of life, it's an interesting phrase. That sometimes might, or some might assume, is talking about sharing salvation with your spouse, where you both are heirs of grace in that way. But that doesn't fit the context here, does it? Peter is dealing with specifically how a believing spouse should deal with an unbelieving spouse. So this is important, or this is important to understand that most likely this is referring to the precious gift of marriage, the gracious gift of marriage that God has given. Peter specifically labeling it the grace of life. Imagine being a newly saved husband and hearing this for the first time in a culture back when most husbands viewed their wives as their property, not their companion. It was a terrible thought, but that's how it was. And so Peter here is saying, listen, you need to be a, the, a true companion to your wife. She is not your property. Men are to graciously and considerately love their wives and invest time and thought and emotion into them. Otherwise, Peter says, their prayers will be what? Their prayers will be hindered. Now, I think that this speaks to the gravity of the importance of our role in marriage. And while the immediate context is probably speaking more of a, a saved husband praying for the salvation of his unsaved wife, there's nothing here that limits it to just that meaning. Peter makes the warning clear that husbands, if you are not fulfilling the God-given responsibilities of your role in marriage, God may not answer your prayers. That is a sobering thought, at least it ought to be, because as a believer, what greater punishment, what greater tragedy than to be separated and interrupted in your prayers with your own Heavenly Father? Husbands, are you loving your wife as Christ loves his church? Are you living in consideration, chivalry, and companionship of your spouse? As we close, I recognize that there are many different marriages and potential marriages represented in this room. And each marriage will look different because marriage is made up of two people that are very different and very unique in their personality, their sin struggles, and their preferences in life. And because of those differences, the prominence of separation and divorce are certainly prevalent. In our journey through 1 Peter, we are learning how different we as followers of Christ are, or at least ought to be, from this world. 
and how every realm, including our marriage, ought to look different than the world. Whatever your case may be, are you demonstrating the love of Christ in your marriage for the sake of winning your spouse to Christ, or if you both are saved, living together in a beautiful picture of Christ in his church? Wives, are you submitting to the God-given leadership of your husband in your relationship? You might say, Pastor, you don't understand. If you would actually lead the right way, then maybe I would submit. Don't forget the context. Peter gives no qualifiers here. Unless the command is is to directly violate scripture or bring harm to yourself or another, God has given the responsibility to, with all grace and all respect, to follow and submit to your husband and seek to transform through what? Godly, Christ-loving, meek, gentle example. Men, are you loving your wife like Christ? That's, again, a very incredibly high standard. Are you seeking to understand your wife? Do you know what makes her happy and what makes her sad? Do you look for signs of fear, anxiety, or insecurity in your wife? And and do you, you do everything that you can to meet her where she is at and calm those fears and those insecurities? Do you make her feel loved and cherished and protected? This is work. As a young man, I'm realizing sometimes how shallow and thick-headed I am in my relationship with people sometimes. We are terrible at just assuming things, aren't we, men? Oh, my wife already knows I love her. She already knows that I think she looks pretty. She already knows that she's good at what she does. But when's the last time you actually ever told her that? Our wives need to hear that from us, men. To accomplish this requires that we go beyond what is natural to how we interact with people. To love your wife is to learn what makes her tick, to learn what brings her joy and sadness, to learn what makes her feel loved and appreciated, and then go and do it so that she can see and even be won by the love of Christ flowing through you. To husbands, to wives, to really everyone, Are you allowing the gospel of Jesus Christ to flow through your marriage, through all your relationships, to point people towards the cross so that Christ is seen in your life, in your marriage, in your relationships, that people would say when they see you, there's someone that loves Christ. Would you bow your heads?